welcome. It's great, great to see everyone here for another uh, research and technology forum the Syracuse COE. My name is Ed Bogish. I'm the executive director. It's my pleasure and privilege to welcome you to this place. We have an international panel. This is our first international panel for this uh, our, our series and we're thrilled to have uh, all, all the speakers. I'm particularly uh, well, welcome uh, Peter Nielsen from Auburn University in Denmark. Uh, i tell you that Peter, after he got his uh, PhD, he went to the Imperial College in, uh, in London and spent a year there on a postdoc. He was there a year before I was there on my master's degree. This is my Imperial College <laughs> scarf, which I'm wearing in honor of Peter. So. <laughs> um, we um, have a, a reminder here. Uh, we've got a lot of a lot of companies in the room. Our uh, our program of uh, commercial assistance uh, funds to uh, support the uh, development of new technologies and bringing them to market. This makes uh, uh, awards of up to fifty thousand dollars. We've made uh, the seventh round of funds uh, that we've uh, awarded. Uh, together with the uh, center state CEO in the process, that that solicit that uh, request for proposals and uh, inv invitation for applications is uh, is out on our website uh, with uh, applications due on December 14th. I want to remind everyone of that. And also, we've got uh, a uh, a great new brochure that talks about our partner program. If your firm is not already a partner of the Syracuse COE, I encourage you to pick up a form uh, afterwards. There's Tammy. <laughs> <laughs> Tammy Rosanio, right, right here, is our uh, lead, leads our partner program. So if you've got questions on uh, on the partner program, please please talk to Tammy. After our program today, we've got a very special uh, uh, reception. Uh, we have an artist's reception. You notice the artwork that's out in the hallway here. The wonderful watercolors painted by Peter Nielsen. Peter's with, with us for a couple of months on a, on a visiting appointment at Syracuse University. So this is the first ever artist reception at the Syracuse Center of Excellence, and we're going to invite you all to, to join us uh, in, in uh, celebrating uh, Peter's uh, multiple talents and his, his artwork. So now without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce John Lawyer, who's going to moderate this, uh, this forum. Uh, John is uh, Vice President of Operations and Energy Solutions for MACNI, the manufacturer's... Do you use the full name or is it just now MACNI? You know, either is fine. Either is fine. <laughs> Call me anything you want, right? So this MACNI is the Manufacturer's Association of Central New York. Actually now it covers a broader region than Central New York, which is why I asked if you still use the, the full name. Uh, MACNI will celebrate its 100th year next year, 2013. So this is one of the oldest manufacturers association in the country. Uh, it has uh, 330 companies really across upstate. Uh, and we celebrate Mackney's uh, leadership in our, our community in central New York and now across upstate. Uh, recently, we had the opportunity to uh, partner with Mackney on a, on a new program. Uh, for uh, advanced manufacturers of thermal and environmental control systems, which should really include all, all of the companies we're going to talk about today. So we welcome, welcome John with us. John joined MACNI in 2004. He's responsible for energy outreach of MACNI, as well as electricity and natural gas buying groups. He's an upstate New Yorker since 1976. He lives with Susan French and their two wonderful children in rural Palm Bay, New York. John Boyd. I always wonder what people would say if uh, their children aren't wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I live with my two kind of awful children. They both have quite nice. Uh, uh, thank you, Ed. Um, that pretty much says what I do at MACNI. Uh, we're very enthusiastic about the, uh, the energy arena in New York State. There's been a lot of uh, change even in the short time that I've been with MACNI. Um, where we, uh, we have companies fully embracing an energy efficient future, um, trying to uh, use advanced technologies to move forward. Um, we have uh, quite a variety of manufacturing uh, types of uh, facilities in the, in the state. 
Um, as Ed mentioned, we represent about a 25 county region um, from all the way to past Rochester, North Country, to Binghamton. Um, in that area, the, the range in counties is anywhere from 22 to 26 percent of the economy is manufacturing. And so uh, obviously uh, they are a disproportionately large consumer of energy. So you know, very impacted by the kinds of work that the folks represented here today. Um, so I encourage you to learn more about MACNI. Uh, uh, actually, even if you don't, we'll be coming and knocking on your door. <laughs> because uh, as part of our outreach effort, we're certainly trying to encourage the community to, uh, to come together around these kinds of themes. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce our three distinguished panelists today. Uh, the first is Brian Key. Uh, from uh, uh, Dick, Dick Dyken McQuay um, out in Auburn. Brian has uh, 25 years of experience in the HVAC business. I have, I have, I have a little written bit here. Uh, HVAC business including systems design, product marketing, business management, geothermal systems applications. In his most recent assignment, uh, he's a uh, products application manager for high performance HVAC systems including geothermal heat pumps with an inverter based variable speed <coughs> compression. I like that one along with two-speed and high-efficiency single-speed water source heat pumps. And I believe I understood almost all the words in that sentence. Um, he's responsible for leading uh, McQuay's application engineering team while educating consulting engineers, design build contractors, facility owner-operators, utility representatives, and the appropriate applications of heat pump systems for high-performance building and LEED-certified projects, licensed professional engineer, LEED-accredited professional, served on several boards uh, at both the uh, regional and national level. Uh, please help me welcome. Uh, Ryan Brooks. Hello, everyone. Wow, that was quite an introduction. I'm not quite sure if uh, I remember uh, writing all of that. <laughs> uh, but um, thank you. I want to thank Ed and Tammy, the center here, for the invitation. And this was through great peer pressure. <laughs> I was asked uh, to uh, present today, and it's it's a pleasure to be here. Um, it was part of you know some of the initial concept creation for this building, so it's it's nice to be here and have a chance to talk with everyone today. Um, I think in today's day and age, you know, all of us are bombarded with information and images and slides and PowerPoint. So today, I'm not going to do that. Uh, I'm going to tell a story, and, and who doesn't like a story? Right? Everybody loves the story. So I thought with the 15 minutes that I have, right, it's 15, that I wasn't going to click through a bunch of slides and show charts and, you know, technology. Let's just tell a story. So let's tell a story about a building. And you guys are going to join in this story, by the way. You have to think about this as I think about it. So think of a building, all right, that perhaps where you work or perhaps where you teach or where you worship or maybe where you live. Just pick a building and put that vision in your mind, right? Now, some of you are struggling with this, I can tell. <laughs> okay, now imagine that building anywhere in the world. All right, so everybody, I, some people are like meditating on this, right? So, okay, so now you have, that, uh, you have that building anywhere in the world. Whatever you're doing in that building, right? Now let's think about how that building functions today. Right? So think about, uh, you know, it's a place where it's comfortable. Right. It's a place where we enjoy the time that we're there, hopefully, right? <laughs> I mean, some buildings you don't enjoy being, you know, like if you're at a penitentiary or something, right? But think about that building and uh, imagine a few things. Imagine if that building could generate enough power for its own purposes so that it doesn't rely on a, uh, a, a, a grid, let's say. Or let's say it doesn't rely on any fossil fuels, right? Because, hey, I'll admit it. Um, Buildings that consume fossil fuels are, are not good. I'll just say that. You know, I'm seeing some consequences of the result of that fossil fuel that we've taken from the earth and we put it in this thin atmosphere. And I think we're seeing some of that. Now, I, I hope I'm wrong, but I think we're seeing some consequences of buildings consuming fossil fuels. So let's imagine our building that doesn't consume fossil fuels. So how could it do that? Well, it could, like I said, it could consume only the electricity that that building could create in and of itself. So now you have to really start thinking of, well, how on earth could you ever do that? So imagine that building, not connected to the grid, and that building is not consuming fossil fuels. Good start. Everybody have that vision in their mind, right? 
Now let's picture that building that is incredibly comfortable, right? Where comfort is just a given. Now here in the United States, we just say comfort is something that we all expect. And when it's not comfortable, what do we do? Well, we complain, right? We'll pick up the phone and we'll call whoever's responsible for that building. And we'll complain that it's either too hot or too cold or too sunny or too dark or whatever. So let's imagine that that's not the case. That the building is absolutely comfortable, like this building that we're in today, very comfortable building, right? So that building now, um, let's just say that it's a smart building. Now, what's, a, what's going to be smart about this building that we're all imagining now? Don't even want to answer, that's okay. <laughs> I know, that's like, oh, I have an answer. <laughs> so that building uh, is a smart building. And it knows that there's how many people in here? 25, 30 people? And it knows that to stay comfortable, that it has to do something, right? And it has to adjust itself accordingly so that um, that comfort is, is going to be maintained. Maybe it's adjusting the amount of air that's gently coming into this space so that we all can breathe, right? Or maybe it's adjusting, you know, whatever system it's connected to that is providing cooling or heating. I think these do both. And uh, perhaps even it's doing things with the shades. I don't know if these are automatic shades or not. But uh, perhaps so. Uh, so just imagine that building, right? Now, let's, uh, let's imagine how that comfort's delivered. It's usually with fans or with pumps, right, that move BTUs, because that's a, my job is to chase BTUs. I chase BTUs all day, right? That's what we do. We figure out where the BTU is going, where are they, how can we get them from one place to another. So let's just say that we need those BTUs to keep us comfortable. And those BTUs um, come at a cost. No BTUs are free. Right? No BTUs are free. They have to come from somewhere. Now, what is the most uh, uh, abundant source of BTUs that we know of today? Somebody said it. The sun. Right? Yeah, yeah, the sun. Now, here on Earth, where does the energy from that sun eventually, where does it end up? <clears throat> in the ground, right? in the Earth. The Earth is this incredible thermal mass. It's, it's awesome. I mean, you, if you calculate the numbers, it's just mind-boggling. So you say, well, what if we take that building that we've been imagining, and we uh, find those BTUs, uh, but they're in the ground? Ah, now, Brian, you've got a dilemma. How on earth are we going to get those BTUs out of the ground, and into these ducts, and into these pipes, and into these diffusers, so that we can stay comfortable? Well, we have to extract them somehow. Um, and that's why I love this building in particular, right? Because there's what 40 some odd wells that have been bored into this massive earth that we have, and pipes buried down into those, down into those wells, and that's like the BTU transporter, you know, like the Starship Enterprise. But this is a BTU transporter, and all it does is it says, well, I want those BTUs from the ground, and I want to put them here in this this, uh, this gathering space so we can be comfortable. So, uh, you know, what I'm really describing here, of course, is geothermal, right? This is geothermal energy. And uh, this is incredible technology. You know, it's, it's been around a long time. I think the first geothermal system was 1954. Remember that? 1954, thereabouts. And it's a BTU pump. It takes BTUs from over there and puts them over there. Now, uh, for a, a, this wonderful building that we're imagining, um, for every BTU that we put into that it consumes, how many BTUs do you think we can extract out of the ground? So one BTU in, remember it's the first law of thermodynamics, right? Energy in equals energy out, right? That's a balance of energy. But with a geothermal heat pump system, you can actually take one BTU of energy uh, that we've, we found in this uh, building Right? because it's not connected to the grid. We've taken that one BTU of energy in, and we've converted it into three, four, maybe five BTUs of useful energy. You say, well, wait a second, Brian. That doesn't make sense. How can you take one BTU of energy in and get three, four, five BTUs out? Anybody know? Yeah, you guys know. It's this thing called a heat pump, right? 
because those other two, three, four BTUs of additional energy, that's coming from this massive Earth that we have. Talk about free BTUs. So our challenge is to move those BTUs from the Earth and put them where we need them. Now to get there, you need a lot of technology, right? You need, you know, we're, we're talking about traditional, this is where like traditional air conditioning, vapor compression, air conditioning, meets up with things like sensor technology, uh, inverter drive, DC driven uh, compression. Um, sensor technology, like what's hanging on the wall over there, that not only measures temperature, because that's the easy one. We, we all know how to measure temperature, but now we're thinking about things like, how do we control the comfort of the air? Well, we need humidity, right? So, uh, uh, thermistats or humidistats that can measure humidity also play into that. Uh, what about the quality of the air that we breathe? You know, uh, how much carbon dioxide is, is in here? And I can assure you, as, as more and more of us are in here, we're breathing more and more, you know, carbon dioxide is building up, and hopefully these things are responding very quickly to that. But what about these things called uh, volatile organic compounds? You know, the things that outgas from carpets, not these carpets, right? Not here. Um, none. But some buildings. <laughs> some buildings, there's these, these things that get in the air that just are not good for us. And they just don't make us healthy. And we're, we hear many great speakers at a lot of the conferences here in town talk about these VOCs. So nowadays, what you see on the wall, it looks like a little gray box or a little box. Of, those things are becoming incredibly intelligent. And they're doing things, uh, this marriage of technology and tradition are coming together. And the company I work for, Dyke and McQuay, we're starting to figure this out. You know? um, Dyke, uh, by the way, is a uh, roughly a $14 billion company, the world's largest air conditioning company in the world. Okay? And how did they get there? Well, they got there because of technology. And what I described about pushing BTUs from one part of a site to another, they figured that out. Okay. They figured out the sensor technology. They figured out uh, variable speed compression. And that's been a difficult thing because of the mechanical side, too. You know, as you start to vary the speed of, of working apparatus, you, you get harmonics and things like to break when you get to a harmonic. So, you know, the engineers at Dyke and McQuay have figured out how to overcome those things. So, that building that we were all imagining, uh, it's, it's not imaginary at all, it's reality. There's many other things in technology today that are driving the comfort, uh, the energy efficiency, something that's so important for us. Um, how we live and work in buildings is getting smarter and smarter and smarter as things go on. So it's kind of the emergence or the, the convergence of technology and tradition that, uh, that uh, we see here going forward. So um, that's my story. One slide. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, with that, I guess I'll turn it over to our next speaker. Let's, uh, let's hear some uh, If you could take a moment, just quietly in your mind, think about what we were just uh, hearing about and come up with the questions that you would most likely have addressed. Yeah, the ROI is based on what people are willing to pay. Um, and, and I'm not being sarcastic, it's absolutely true. We have fantastic technology. It comes at a cost. Um, what we're finding from a practical standpoint, um, if, if the building can pay for itself for two to three years, that's good. It's very good. That's if you're in the business of turning it over and selling it later on in a very short period of time. But if you're an owner-occupier, like right here, you're willing to invest to benefit yourself and, and the purpose of your building for a much longer period of time. So that return, the tolerance toward a longer uh, return on investment you know, from a time perspective is, is, is uh, longer. Um, but some of the systems today, uh, you know, I can compare a uh, high efficiency geothermal heat pump system today versus some more traditional fossil fuel <coughs> generating equipment and oh my goodness the payback time takes many many years um, <coughs> but uh, the answer to that is usually the tolerance uh, and the willingness to invest for the 
purpose of that investment. So, sorry if I didn't have an exact no, no, answer for you. Um, all, on the same lines, uh, uh, do you find that uh, buildings are being retrofitted with these kinds of systems, or is it uh, primarily new construction? Yeah, this year is a good. That's a good question to ask for this year, right? Because new construction is just uh, very, very slow. Um, school market's down 22 percent. Office build is off 14 percent. Um, healthcare is off as well. The other thing that's really it's amazing, like industry that's growing this year is hotel motels. Um, that's I guess in a school year, can't lie. But uh, um, for these types of systems, uh, absolutely capable of going into any building, but there's contingencies based on land mass, you know, where the geology is and how it is. But um, uh, from uh, most of our installations, they're going into existing buildings, 70 to 80 percent. The higher technology, however, tends to go into the newer buildings designed to accommodate you know, these types of systems. Next question. Uh, what's the latest and greatest that's coming out of Dyke and McQuack? The latest and greatest is, uh, well, imagine systems that you can't hear, right? Imagine a system that is uh, uh, <coughs> so quiet that you don't even know it's here. Like, I can't hear what's going on with these systems, right? So imagine a, a system driven by a fan, where the fan has taken on biomimicry, right? Picture an owl's wing, right? Now, an owl, an owl is a silent flyer, right? So the engineers have studied that profile on the trailing edge of, of those feathers to find out what is, why are, how can they do that? And imagine taking, you know, that, uh, that profile and embedded it, embedding it into centrifugal blowers, you know, a fan. The engineers have figured that out, and it's, it's incredible. So, yeah, I mean, that's one thing, uh, infinitely variable capacity control. Uh, you're seeing it today with, you know, some of you have already installed these systems. BRV type systems. Some of the audience have done some already. Variable refrigerant volume is coming along. Why produce more capacity than what's needed? It's wasted. Or it's it's not benefiting the purpose of, of uh, creating that air conditioning. So, you know, uh, infinitely variable uh, compression technology. I'll tell you another one. I call it buy a computer with throwing a motor. Uh, they're called ECM motors. And these motors actually have uh, embedded circuitry where they're smart enough to know the current draw, the RPMs, will take and embed a fan curve into that motor so the motor knows where it is based on that, those conditions, it knows its torque. And so it will deliver a fixed CFM regardless of what's happening with the filter or the dampers or the, anything else external to it. And so pretty exciting stuff. So you're going to see more and more of that. You know, going Next question. The uh, question, one question that comes to my mind uh, uh, for commercial units, uh, uh, utility-based uh, geothermal units, I know there's a, an issue of uh, uh, aging and disseminate, you know, the inability of the system to sustain itself over 15, 20 year period of time that eventually needs to be recharged. Do you find that with building size systems as well that they have to plan for 20 year lifespan? Yeah, that's a good question. Let me explain it a little bit, right? Those BTUs that I was talking about, every building has a balance or has so many BTUs that it needs for heating and so many that it needs for cooling. And if they're absolutely identical throughout the year, you have a, a net zero. But guess what? You know, here, you know, northern climates, there's more heating BTUs that are needed, right? So the ground is actually going to be getting colder. Now you go south and there's more cooling BTUs, so as a result, you have to take that heat and put it into the ground. And through time, there's this thermal saturation of the geothermal blue field. That imbalance causes that to occur. It's going to be more prominent if that geothermal loop field is too small. They call it short loops, or just you know, too densely packed uh, of, a, of a loop field. And through time, you're going to get what's called thermal saturation, either getting warmer or getting colder. right? Now, there's programs that can predict this stuff. I mean, they can kind of tell you if it's going to get colder or warmer. Um, the best thing is hire a good engineer. <laughs> hire a good engineer who can predict this, and it's possible to 
Um, well, we make the equipment. Uh, there's some other good engineers here, right? We can take care of that. But it's all solvable. You know, it's like I said, chasing the BTUs. When does that need a new? I don't know. <laughs> but there's ways to solve it. I mean, if it tends to get uh, colder, the boilers. <laughs> Did I say that? Oh, it's fossil, not a non-fossil. Now, if it's getting warmer, you can add a cooling tower. Now, these are hybrid systems I just described. Yeah, they're common. Any other questions? Thank you very much.